Hi, everybody. Welcome to SciArc. Uh, my name is Elena Manferdini. I'm the Graduate Program Chair here at SciArc. And uh, this is one of our internal lectures for the graduate thesis students uh, that during the summer 2021 are working on their projects. Uh, this uh, lecture series is called Format, and this year the theme of uh, the classes that we're going to listen to is Expanding the Archives. Uh, the people that are going to lecture to in, in this lecture series have been asked to share with us their ideas about archives and their personal work. And today I'm going to introduce John Carpenter, who is a friend, a colleague, and um, I've been looking at his work for some time. Um, he was very close to Syed with his previous office, and I brought many times the students to see what he has been working on. Uh, John is an artist, a designer, and also he's an educator. And he works with code and software to create visualization of the world around him. He's based in Los Angeles, and right now he works as um, at um, HRL Laboratories, and also he's a visiting lecturer at USC in the School of Cinema and Arts. Prior to joining HRL, John worked at Oblong, which is where I met him, and he has been the lead prototyping person to build a gesture-based interactive real-time interface. So he does something very difficult, which is to manage a lot of data uh, in an intuitive way. He has also worked at Morphosis Architecture, so he understands architects, and also at the Biological Imaging Center uh, at the California Institute of Technology. He earns his MFA from the Design Media Arts at UCLA, so we're all growing here, and also his BS in Molecular and Cellular Biology from University of Arizona. Thank you, John, for being with us, and we're looking forward to see your work. Well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to, to give this talk. I, uh, yeah, it's exciting to look back at this. Uh, it's been a little while since I, I've looked at some of the Oblong work, and um, yeah, that, it's, uh, yeah I, think, I think it will be perfect for the class and, and very relevant to archives and data. Um, so the talk is going to be divided into two parts today. Uh, one is sort of the trajectory in and out of grad school. And then uh, part two will be some of the work that Elena uh, you know, spoke of and that she saw when she visited Oblong and, and brought students through. So um, it should be a lot of fun. I, I think I wanted to start with the, the grad school trajectory part, because when I was in grad school, I was really concerned that I didn't have everything figured out. and. Um, you know, looking back, at my last two jobs didn't even exist when I was in grad school. So it's certainly good to have some of that pressure to figure things out. But uh, I followed the things that I was most interested and passionate about and worked hard and, and was really fortunate to land in some positions where I, I got to sort of create new jobs at really cool places. Uh, so I, I as, as I mentioned, I got my, my degree in molecular biology and most of my friends and colleagues went off to med school or grad school and I went to work at uh, Caltech for David Kramers, who's the Caltech conceptual artist. And he was doing uh, research looking at Van Gogh's brushstroke techniques and the type of information that Van Gogh was able to capture uh, in those paintings and was applying it to diffusion tensor imaging of mouse spinal cords. And so this, this here, I mean, we're starting with kind of an interesting, uh, we're starting with, oh, can I get rid of my little video? There we go, cool. Uh, we were starting with like an archive of data, right? This is, this is a nine dimensional data set that has been turned into a painting. And, um, uh, you can see a healthy organism over on the left and a diseased organism over on the right. And then this painting, this data visualization, was able to turn that data into something that could sort of see into the future. It could predict which organisms would get encephalitis. And it also created real clear qualitative and quantitative pictures of uh, what was going on. So the color of the brushstroke and the angle of the brushstroke and the density of the brushstrokes all, all uh, gave the researchers different levels of information or different dimensions of information about the data that they were looking at. Uh, my work at, at 
Caltech was, uh, or amongst a lot of projects, was this Mouse Atlas project. And that's where I got into code and that's where I got into sort of uh, uh, interaction design and, and UX design. And I, um, this was built in Flash because that was cool back in 2003. It's what everybody used. And, and the point of this Atlas database was to share anatomical data with other researchers. So research, people could come to this site and say, hey, I, I'm interested in what typical mouse anatomy looks like at a certain point, and they could download that data and, and, and also kind of search through it and look at it uh, on these pages. Um, yeah, so as I was, I'd been at Caltech for four or five years, and then Tom and Morphosis got the astrophysics building uh, at, at Caltech. And um, I'd been in academia, you know, I graduated, and then I, I worked in another, like Caltech is an academic institution. Um, and I, you know, I kind of was interested in trying something else. And, and David, who I worked for, was on the architecture committee at Caltech and introduced me to Tom and uh, Anne-Marie Burke. Uh, here's Annie. So she and she helps run the School of Architecture at UCLA now. But they introduced me to them. I said, hey, you know, some of these ideas that we've been working on with systems and interaction design and nonlinear ways to progress through data would be applicable to your research. And Tom was like, yeah, that sounds cool. Let's, 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 you know, we'll, we'll give you a shot and let's just do it. And I worked in the business development group because they kind of didn't know where to put me. And one of my primary functions was to help Tom put his presentations together and help uh, sort of get all of the company's visuals uh, into a place where he could use them and, and he was happy with them. One of my first jobs was to go through the print and model archives with Tom uh, over a summer in the Santa Monica office. Uh, and that was like 2006 or so, 2007 maybe. And um, it's funny, at the time it was like, oh man, this, this worked. But in retrospect, it was this incredible opportunity to get to talk with Tom and find out, you know, uh, learn more about how he thought and how he approached systems and architecture. And, and um, seeing these works that are largely collected in his Tangents and Outtakes book from 93, uh, was really inspirational to me, and I, it, it shaped the way I approach visualization and and looking at spaces. So, in particular, some of these like two D sectional drawings where he's pulling three D elements out and adding all sorts of interesting layers and shadows of other systems in in the in the work um, has been really inspirational to me. So that that was an yeah amazing amazing opportunity. So. Um, so here's a nice little case study of the type of work we're doing. So typically the architects would do these case studies with axonometrics or, um, you know, exploded axos of, of different programmatic elements in the building. And I said, okay, well, let's use some of this interactive uh, media to do this in nonlinear ways and let you sort of build those components up and break them down in any way you want. And, and, and Tom really liked that because Tom likes to present and kind of make things up on the fly. Well, not make things up on the fly, but he likes to, he likes to be able to respond to his clients or to the audience and be able to reshape things on the fly uh, so that he can communicate kind of whatever idea that they're interested in. So um, we'll go through kind of a quick history of, of interactive uh, uh, media types. Like this, this is director, which is another thing that probably I would guess 98% of people on this talk have never heard of. Uh, but it was sort of an in-between point between uh, uh, Flash and Unity. And so eventually we ended up, uh, these are directors still, um, but eventually we ended up in Unity building applications for him to be able to present to clients or, or uh, at lectures and things. And, and we were able to capture kind of all these uh, pieces of the system, you know, you could, you could turn on circulation and you could turn on structural and, but, um, and it would allow him to sort of go through and talk about the work however he liked and however related to sort of the slides before and after. And we still had some of the classic things that, that everybody always loved, like these exploded axos, and you could do nice transitions between them. Um, you know, and, and then as time went on, we used, uh, the, we used Unity in more in interesting ways where we created these walkthroughs where clients could go explore the building ahead of time and get a sense, of, basically video games for people to go explore their buildings and see where they might be lecturing or where their office would be. Um, okay, so last part of this sort of, uh, introduction as uh, a grad school at UCLA. And I was fortunate enough to um, be able to work with uh, Casey Reese and um, and Jennifer Steinkamp, among other professors. And I, you know, I went to grad school because I, I'd been, you know, working with interactive media and software and, and, and uh, code 
but I, I, I didn't really have official training in it. And I kind of realized that I needed to have a higher degree, like an MFA or, or PhD to do some of the work that I wanted to do, like teach or work at some of the institutions that I wanted to be at. Um, so I went to grad school and I studied uh, uh, natural systems and, and ways to represent them with code and ways to interact them with, uh, ways to interact with them with Jester or, um, you know, different new devices. And so uh, a lot of that work was simulating natural systems with code. So this is kind of a fun uh, little study um, based on a flower in Oregon. Um, and figuring out fun ways to use things like the connect sensor to an optical flow to drive motion and interaction. And, um, and, and Again, like I mentioned earlier, I, I didn't have this super clear path on exactly where I wanted to be, but I knew that I liked immersion and I knew that I liked gesture and I knew that I liked code and um, interaction design. These are a couple other pieces that sort of combine those two things. They're sort of simulating natural systems and, and, and creating interactivity as a way to uh, more intimately experience sort of some of these observations that I had of nature. Uh, this wasn't my thesis work. My actual thesis work was shoreline equivalent, and I, I unfortunately don't have any great videos of it. And but the piece was a series of drawings of waves that would move up the floor and up the wall and back. And as people sort of walked around in them, they could interact with them and uh, cause new patterns and systems. And 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 the the system would sort of constantly evolve and change. Uh, this was all back before Connect, actually. So I was doing like. Uh, IR blob detection and tracking in, in the space. It was kind of fun. Uh, I'm still doing installations from time to time. It's been, it's been a little while. Um, this was a piece in Germany a while back. Um, oh, Justin Schrake. Well, I, I'm going to talk about him in a little bit because he and I worked on some projects like this together, and then we did a lot of work at Oblong together. So we'll see his name again. Um, but yeah, a lot of recent works kind of involved Connect and just these fun uh, explorations of form and shape and time. Um, most recently, a lot of the work's just been on Instagram. And if you're interested in sort of random studies, that's where I post a lot of this kind of stuff. And that Elena and I talk on there from time to time and keep in touch. Um, and, and there has been some interesting artifacts that have grown out of uh, some of that work and, and collaboration. Um, okay, so here's, here's sort of the real um, part of the presentation. It's looking at some of the gestural uh, interface and immersive design work that I was doing at Oblong. So I worked at Oblong from 2012 to 2020, and uh, I was part of the advanced technology group. So we did a lot of the prototyping and uh, explorative design that made its way into um, some of the other products in the company. And we also did a lot of custom client work with people like IBM. Star navigation that looked at Hipparcos and uh, Kepler data uh, of nearby star systems and exoplanets. All right, when you um, use a mouse, your hand is down here on the mouse pad. Yeah, oops, it's not even the same. Skip the slide. Uh, okay, so oblong. Um, people are like, uh, people always kind of think they've heard oblong before and they're trying to place it. And so ba basically, to give you that background, uh, John Underkoffler founded oblong in 2006. After working on uh, the movie Minority Report with, with some of the team from uh, MIT, and he went on to work on a number of sort of uh, iconic gesture and visualization scenes like uh, Iron Man and um, you know, some other movies. And he, he founded the company to make this technology uh, reality. And, and uh, you know, a lot of it was based on right. when you use a mouse, your hand is down here on his the mouse research pad. It's not even the same MIT. plane as what you're talking about. Pixels are up on the display. So here was a room in which all the walls, floors, ceilings, pets, potted plants, whatever was in there was capable not only of display, but of sensing as well. And that means input and output are in the same space, enabling stuff like this. That's digital storage in a physical container. Contract is the same as with real world objects in real world containers has to come back out, whatever you put in. <laughs> so this little design experiment. A lot of his, his thesis is really incredible and worth going back and looking at if you're interested in immersive design and uh, uh, like room-based pixel spaces. But a lot of the work that we're doing or we were doing was, was based on that research. So I got there. And I found this sort of technology playground where you could kind of do anything and have pixels everywhere and have sensors everywhere. And you could have multiple machines interacting with each other. 
and multiple sensors interacting with each other. In this case, there's this sort of generative tree L system that's uh, grown on one system and then moved over using the connect to another system and then interacted with, with a, a elite motion. And, and there's just a bunch of this kind of neat stuff here. So here's a mobile device controlling an image across four different operating systems. Um, and, and sort of uh, temporally and spatially synced across all those different systems. This is Alex Valley. He trained, <laughs> he taught me, he's a great guy. He taught me a lot of, uh, uh, he, he made all my introductions to GSpeak and C++ and the frameworks that we were using there. Uh, this is one of your professors at SciArc. So we even have done some experiments where we tie physical hardware into the, the spatial operating environment that we work with. This is a robot arm responding to one of our wands that's being moved around a space and it's changing your view into a virtual system based on the screen uh, on the robot arm. Um, Pete Hawks worked on that as well uh, from Abla. So a lot of my work was uh, gesture-based stuff. So I was hired as a designer and a creative technologist, software engineer, uh, to sort of figure out how to use some of Oblong's tools and, and, and figure out how to make them more accessible to uh, people other than you know, the 20 people at Oblong uh, on this advanced technology group that, that always worked with this C++ frame, framework. And there were a lot of hurdles to, to sort of get over. So they started developing for designers like me who are less familiar with some of the, the uh, um, core programming environment to be able to do stuff like these, these gesture-based interactions with a brain visualization. And it was a lot of fun too, because I, I mean, this is really similar to the, the minority report work, right? So and that, that kind of was a lot of my early inspiration. It was like, hey, okay, I'm working at the company that um, you know, pioneered a lot of these visuals. Let's let's try to make things kind of like it that we can demo and and, and show off. So this is a, a hand like a, a pipeline called Antenna that was a custom oblong pipeline that did a bunch of gesture recognition. Um, fun stuff. Uh, here's another early piece. It's a, a an earthquake visualization, and this one's run across. I think this is one machine, but three different screens and resolutions. And uh, just uh, the point of it is to explore gesture as a way to interact with data. So I think this is like a five years of earthquake data uh, across the globe. Um, yeah, so in addition to doing prototyping, uh, I was also, or I IBM hired Oblong in, it was like 2010 uh, ish. No, no, I started in 2012. It was two years after that. So it was like 2014. Um, IBM came to Oblong and said, hey, we want to build some real time software based environments to explore Watson uh, API services. And this is sort of the space that we want to create at Astor Place in New York. And we want a big immersive room and we want a big media wall to do these real time applications on. Uh, so we prototype that that space at Oblong. This looks very familiar to Elena. I'm, I'm sure anyone who's visited Oblong up until recently, this was over by the Gun Club and LAB climbing gym, kind of right catty corner to it. Unfortunately, it's not there anymore. I think a lot of the equipment's at uh, USC now. But we we built this kind of really cool prototyping space, and this is where I spent. I don't know, six years of my life uh, prototyping cool interactive projects. So a lot of the rest of this talk are some of those cool interactive prototypes for these sort of architectural pixel spaces. Um, so I recent, I, I just wrote a paper that got uh, um, accepted to Leonardo and I'll show you that in a little bit. But one of the things I got dinged on in my, in my paper was that I didn't give any precedence for some of the research we're doing. So to do that now, and because this is sort of an educational talk, uh, the Electronic Visualization Laboratory at the University of Illinois at Chicago uh, has pioneered a lot of these cave technologies and research, and they have a really nice uh, product-based system that works with Unity and a couple different things for doing these type of installations. So um, they're definitely worth looking at if you're into this kind of stuff. And they, they've been kind of uh, pioneers in this field since 92. They presented at SIGGRAPH on, on a cave with these super groovy glasses. They were doing some 3D stuff with the screens. but. There's a bunch of really interesting work coming out of there. So if you're interested in this space, they're definitely ones to look at. Uh, there are also a lot of artists right now that are working um, in a similar space. So Rick Beek, uh, at which I'm sure a lot of you know, based in LA, has, uh, did this archive dreaming project with Google. 
and created this almost cave-like space, but used mirrors across the top and the bottom and got these really beautiful results. It's a stunning project. It's, it's, it's really, really nice. So he's definitely worth looking at as well. Uh, and then there's just, there's some other designers like Design.io um, or Team Lab that do a lot of big, immersive, really beautiful uh, presentations. So how does, what, what's different about our work? What's, why, uh, you know, yeah, what's different about our work? So we're using GSpeak and it's a spatial operating environment that allows real-time operation and uh, programs to be run in these sort of architectural spaces. It allows you to, link multiple computing systems and screens and perspectives. And in this case, like the, that hexagonal room that we started with for IBM was five computers running 45 screens and 93 million pixels. Um, and how we do that is uh, we, there's an origin in the spatial operating environment. So there's a physical origin in the physical space uh, that all of the screens are calibrated to. So every pixel in space has an X, Y, and Z position and an orientation. And that allows the system to determine how to correctly render visuals. And so um, that allows us to do th things like gesture to fly around and move through systems. It, it very much becomes like the ship of the, imagine I, I, the imagination. I approached my design here like I was creating large virtual environments and then flying and moving through them in, in the system using the gesture interactions. Um, so uh, yeah, to flip flip over, like a lot of a lot of what we're doing for IBM was, hey, okay, we have this huge data set and we have our services. How do we how do we navigate these huge data sets? So a lot of my work was to prototype um, using our software and using our technology to explore how I might look at large data sets. This is Iliad or something. I I'm kind of yeah, I think it might be the Iliad broken up into. Uh, I think we just did a test on word length and and put it into separate layers and exploded them out as a way to sort of interact with it. And um, yeah, it's fun. It's kind of a way to follow intuition in, in my design work. This piece didn't turn into anything. It was kind of a fun demo, but it did lead to some of this work where we were looking at large image, image sets and trying to find interesting ways to, to interact with them. So uh, what IBM would come in and say is, okay, so we're going to use some of, some of our machine learning and our image classification as a way to uh, analyze the image, image sets. And then we're going to combine that with uh, interesting UX and UI design as a way to, to sort of explore this data in a new way and see new things. Um, so the bottom right is sort of the closest to what was actually installed eventually. Um, and OK, so back to the hexagonal room. So a lot of my favorite work was actually creating uh, interfaces based around these architect, like the screen architectures. So this is kind of a little series of some prototypes that I did for uh, one of the early works installed at Astor Place. And, uh, and this piece was uh, an installation that looked at a bunch of different companies and gave uh, viewers and clients uh, sort of augmented views of, of their the company based on sort of uh, data that was uh, publicly available and associated with them. So this is the actual installation. This is one of those like 3 a.m. videos where you finally got the thing to work and it's the night before the install. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a fun way to interact with the data and see a bunch of different perspectives on it. Uh, here's another uh, fun series of um, uh, prototypes. This one was this one never turned into something that led to another one, another piece, but this, this was looking at like 12 or 13 dimensions of uh, sales data for an organization. And the point of it was to be able to sort of really quickly look at it all and, and find points of interest like this big blue spike. And, and the idea was like, okay, what's that big blue spike? Why is it only in that time? So 360 degrees was one year and then there was a bunch of data normalized and uh, extended up based on, uh, you know, whatever factors we were interested in looking at. So this piece went through a lot of iterations. It became this like big cylinder that uh, went out in the space. My favorite iteration of it though was this sort of uh, spherical version of it that, that um, we called the Death Star. It, it, uh, and again, each, each band, uh, each, each loop around uh, the sphere was, uh, that 360 degrees was one year, so January to December. And all the data was normalized and exploded off this sphere. Um, there's also some kind of other neat little 
interface elements that I, I guess are outside of the view of this video, but uh, I applied a lot of what I knew from architecture to this too. So there's, there's sectional planes that show over on the left and there's uh, like floor plans of each level over on the left as well. So that work in combination with this little prototype uh, led to uh, News Discovery, which was a project we did with uh, uh, IBM Watson and Jenny Wu, who is the IBM design lead that I worked with. Um, and, and what this application did, this, this, okay, so if you've been like watching the soccer game or something like that, this is the one project that Lena asked me to sort of make sure I talked about um, and that we tended to demo. So this one uh, looks at, you know, 40 to 60,000 English news language articles every day and does analysis on them to look for sentiment and concept extraction and location extraction and uh, creates this huge news aggregator and explorer that allows you to sort of look at the news in a new way and explore connections in the news. We did uh, a bunch of interesting UI work. We had these neat expandable and collapsible interfaces where every element that came up would sort of take center stage and offset uh, some of the other elements that um, you know, you're working with. So here's a, yeah. You can see a bit of that. So what, how, how it would work is you would select a concept from any of the thousands of concepts that were floating around you and you could dive deeper into it and uh, eventually get, sort of narrow these 50,000 news articles down to um, you know, 400 or 20 or whatever, whatever kind of uh, refinement you were interested in, whatever filtering you're interested in. Um, yeah, and this, this very much was in lines with Again, the story that IBM liked to tell, hey, there's a ton of data out there. We can help you make sense of it by through good design and through Watson services and APIs. Um, okay, so here's a, here's a little demo. We already, you know, we were down to 263 articles at this point because I've selected two different concepts. I have sentiment analysis on around this concepts. I have the concept extractions on and a few concepts selected. And now I'm sort of, circling the globe, you can kind of get an idea of the global reach of an idea or concept here. Um, and then at that point, you can say, okay, well, let's see the headlines of some of these articles in, of these 263 articles. So that's what I'm doing there. I'm panning through these articles and then I'll select one and it'll offset the globe over or all the way around to the other side of the system and bring up, oh, go back and bring up, um, the actual article over on the right and bring up uh, Watson's analysis of it and, and sort of tells you the factors it's seen and what it thinks of everything. Um, no. And uh, yeah, so that was, a, yeah, that was a fun project and I think very relevant to the, the class topics and ideas that you're, you're uh, covering. Um, I, went through, I, I went through my archives and kind of found a couple other fun little data focused and gesture based uh, Studies, these are all photogrammetry studies of, um, forget where, uh, but these were done with local projects. I have their name later on. So a lot of, a lot of the uh, asset production and design was done with uh, local projects in New York and, and, and of course for IBM. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, so here's, here's some LiDAR data prototype. This one's, this turned into a pretty fun project. Originally we started with these like blocks of LiDAR scans of New York. And eventually we moved towards uh, this uh, modeled version of New York as a way to interact with the data. So th this was a disaster response module uh, talking about how uh, Watson could sort of enhance first responders' abilities to uh, respond to, uh, you know, some emergency. And, and the idea of the work was that it created this sort of augmented city view that gave you all sorts of additional layers of information that were related to the decisions that these first responders needed to make. Um, yeah, and so as you can see, you could sort of dive into the city and we it basically, these modules were created for like an experienced leader to talk to, um, uh, you know, potential clients when they came into the IBM spaces. Uh, we also did some uh, supply chain work, uh, looking at, and, and building these immersive systems for oh, volume should be down on this one. Uh, looking uh, at how uh, certain events could affect supply chains. 
kind of fun interactive real time systems. And again, there's a lot of this like right. You can do it non. It, it can be nonlinear. You can choose a bunch of different uh, ways to organize stuff and go through it based on you know what the audience was interested in or what they kind of wanted to talk about. Um, these are a couple other sort of just prototypes that never really turned into anything. This is kind of stuff that ends up on Instagram a lot of the time as as a way to just sort of track some of the stuff I'm thinking about and ideas that I'm talking about. Um, this is another sort of node-based system. We were looking at uh, complex networks, and this is just a simple L system uh, branching out, but we're just sort of distorting it in some different ways and letting it grow out in different ways. Uh, and then this and how information process progresses through them and, and is edited. Uh, we also did, uh, you know, sometimes these prototypes did turn into interesting projects. This is a, uh, an application that was designed to talk about machine learning and image classification. So, um, you know, a lot, a lot of these things uh, like machine learning or image classification, there, you know, there are some visuals associated with them, but they might not be uh, entirely informative to someone who doesn't uh, understand the research. So we created these sort of visual metaphors for what was going on. This was just kind of a fun test, but it looks cool. So I, I left it in there. But um, I, I, I just uh, so I called Justin out here. So he's J2RGB on Instagram and, and a pretty cool um, designer. He's at Magnopus now, which is also in the neighborhood down there by Cyark. And um, you know, we did a lot of this prototyping and design and, and would go back and forth and he would come up with a system type something with 4 million and he'd have to redesign it. And um, yeah, a lot of really fun things grew, grew out of this, uh, that collaboration. Uh, like, like the Sprite Swarm application that allowed us to do these big, you know, million particle system simulations in the space. And here's another one. Uh, okay, yeah, and here's, uh, I'm not sure how this looks on your guys' end, but it, it, it's kind of a mess on this end, too. This was a test to see uh, how many particles we could get around, flying around and, and still sort of uh, do some neat things. Anyway, oh, so to end, and I apologize, I went through stuff a little bit faster than I want. There's still a couple minutes of things, but uh, this, this, is this, uh, uh, this is the research that just recently got accepted to uh, Leonardo. It's some part visualization work. Uh, that I did with Dr. Rusty Lansford from Children's Hospital and, and USC in LA. And here's Rusty talking first for a trimester of development, try and study how organs form normally, and then when things go a little bit wrong. And and so Rusty and I were friends from Caltech. He was there when I was there in Scott Fraser's lab, but. Um, he'd come by the office to visit, and I showed him some of this research. This is a brain visualization that we did as a prototype um, back actually when I started the company. Um, and, you know, he saw this work and said, hey, you know, I, I've got this research. Uh, I've got this research that looks like this, you know, do you, that, that actually kind of reminds me that, that some of the brain structures, like, do you think we could figure out some interesting way to uh, visualize it? I'm having a lot of trouble seeing the things that I want to see. I'm having trouble uh, seeing the relationships that I want to see, and I'm having trouble isolating some of the move, like cell movements that I'm interested in. Um, so I, I, I wrote some custom software form uh, that allowed us to do things like retrospective analysis, where you can select a region and see uh, where the cells started before they migrated there. It allowed you to sort of parse through time. It allowed you to immerse the user in the data. And um, here was sort of one of the first uh, installation tests, which was really fun because it immersed you in a really neat way. Um, and I, you know, I, I realize there's other immersive technologies out there that have definitely have advantages. AR, MR, VR. Um, I'm sure you'll talk to some people that that work in those spaces. And and one of the key advantages of like AR, MR is that you can get a Hololens and you don't have to do a you know couple, I, I'm not sure how much these systems were, but a big system with 45 screens and five uh, computers is, is pretty pricey pretty quickly. And so uh, 
like I said, there are some advantages to something like AR and VR, but I, I really enjoyed working with these pixel spaces because they, they were very architectural on scale. They defined space in an interesting way, uh, which I found encouraged collaboration and um, interaction and, 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 and those sort of the physical presence of these screens a lot of times help ground people and orient them in the spaces. So, um, you know, and we had access to them. So, but, uh, you know, as we were working with them, Rusty sort of uh, really found that, you know, he could sort of access the information he wanted to, and he was seeing new things and he was able to experience the data in new ways and talk to it, uh, talk to other people about it and present it in new ways. So, um, yeah, we, uh, so we wrote up, yeah, wrote up this paper on uh, 40 image sets for early heart development. And that, that'll be in Leonardo sometime in the next year. I'm not sure exactly when it comes out, but the paper is already out there if you go search for it. Uh, yeah, so I, <laughs> like I said, I went through it really quickly. We could have conversation. I have some fun stuff at the end too that are just like, random studies that I did that we can look at as well. But, uh, uh, you know, what, what would be most valuable? Do you think it would be fun to have, you know, questions or conversation or talk more about any of the pieces in the presentation or to just show well, us? Some you can tell us what is next. I think it would be great to see the rest of the work and maybe you can just tell us okay. what is next. Because I think some of the work you do is really speculative work. You have an intuition yeah. about something that will well, then you build the technology towards it. And I'm wondering, you already told us a bit about what is the difference between the oblong and 24 screens or uh, AR and VR. And I think you gave us somehow trajectory there, but what do you think is next uh, in terms of data visualization? It's maybe one of the most uh, interesting questions. Yeah, well, you know, I think, I think, I think it, in the near future, it's probably going to be iterations of some of the technology we have. So I think AR, like the HoloLens keeps getting better. And um, I, I think there's a huge amount of potential with the HoloLens and mixed reality. Um, that, that's sort of one of the spaces that's most exciting to me. Um, we are going to continue to get some of these like physical spaces. I think there's an incredible amount of opportunity for inter uh, integrating pixel-based technology into architectural spaces. And there are some companies that, um, you know, I, I was looking, I was looking for something new before I ended up at HRL, and uh, I talked to Gensler and some different companies that are doing some really interesting uh, pixel-based integration. Over the last year or two, a lot of that sort of public, um, public space-based uh, digital installation stuff has kind of gone away because of COVID, but I, I think that'll come back. And I, I think, I think there's, there's really interesting potential iterations of this kind of stuff all over, like the stuff John was talking about, you know, like every, this idea that every surface in a room could be an input and an output device could show you something, you know, you could see that you see it in the movies. Now you could, I could imagine that being some interesting architectural projects where you look at how, uh, embedded pixels or embedded technology in architectural spaces could be uh, used for all sorts of interesting things. And I, I know people are doing that. And then, um, you know, some of the, there's really, Holo, uh, the HoloLens guys did a collaboration with JPL uh, looking at Mars data that was a really fantastic project. Um, and I think that that's an indication of where some of the technology could go. So they had groups of people interacting with, uh, they all had the HoloLens on and they had a shared, uh, some similarities to this, they had a shared physical space that the virtual space was overlapped with and they were able to look at rovers and they were able to look at data from the surface of Mars. And um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure, I'm not, I, that's probably not the most exciting answer in, in the world, but it, I, I do think there's gonna be some really interesting iterations of this, the, of this kind of technology. So higher resolution AR glasses and uh, more integrated pixel surfaces where you don't even see the screens uh, because either they're behind some veneer or they're, you know, directly integrated into some material that I think, you know, maybe the super near future. And then I think, I think kind of our experience with that and how people figure out to do interesting things with it will sort of help define what the next technology is or what the next evolutions of it are. Does that, does that sort of answer the question or is it, did I, no, no, it's, it's, it's great to hear from you, yes. Uh, 
Um, and I, I'd love, if there's questions or anything, I'd love to hear, you know, um, yeah, love to have a conversation about it, uh, about stuff. Um, I can show some, yeah, like, oh yeah, did, did somebody have a question? Um, I think there is one question uh, from a student. I then had one as well, but um, I can I can read the question from this student first. It's from uh, Barack. He says, thank you for the great presentation. When you showed the morphosis example, I realized that interactive presentation could also work as an instant feedback based meeting with clients. Where do you think it's going to be in the next years? Um, so, so kind of, oh, are we talking virtually or are we talking physically or um, how, so, so client interactions. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and they're, they're definitely on uh, an area that a lot of people are, uh, doing a lot of research and then spending a lot of money on right now, like Zoom or Oblong or uh, some of these different companies. But are, are, is... Yeah. I, well, I don't want to speak for Brock. Brock, uh, I don't know if you just want to ask the question. You could just... Uh, uh, I think awesome. Mayu said the HoloLens and the, the okay. Unity example, it was super related to the client meetings. And I believe uh, the interaction between them, the both, both sides, like the architect and the client would meet the topic, I guess. It doesn't have to be AR or VR or mixed reality with HoloLens, but I, I believe when you showed the example of Morphosis, I thought it could be anything interactive and work as a, as a two-sided two um, like dialogue between architect and the client, I, I guess. Yeah, so that's, that's a great, okay, yeah, you're fantastic question. You're talking about a lot of the things that are sort of being talked about right now in the circles that that I'm in, and and those are all great great problems to be thinking about. I mean, so one, I can give you a little bit of, um, okay. So some of these examples where Rusty and I are talking. So this this was a really interesting experience, and um, uh, or even okay, let's come let's come back to this one. Let's go a little bit further back. Uh, so this system back here. Oh, even the globe one. That's a good one. Okay. So this news discovery. So I created a version of this initially that you could rotate the globe in any direction you wanted. And the whole idea of this, of this was to give this to an experienced leader to be able to drive this system. And, and when you could rotate this, rotate this thing in any way that you want, really quickly, people would get lost and disoriented and the data wouldn't be aligned correctly. And there's there's some things you need to think about. So there, there's there's a balance between the amount of um, freedom that I think you give your audience or give your user and um, that you create. I, I'm all for giving all the power to the user and and the, and the person driving the system. But uh, I very quickly discovered that someone like me who had worked with the system a bunch and developed it over six months could do anything I wanted and not get lost, not, not misorient the, the, the system, but they within 30 seconds had things upside down and like off the screens, like there, there's no, there's no bumpers on, on a lot of this system. So if you wanted to, you could grab the earth and put it off the screen and then just lose it. And then, then like, and that happened and there were bugs where, you know, I would, you would grab the system and the gesture detection would detect that and you would move it. And it would lose it would lose the the release of the gesture and and just send this thing off into space and then you know so I had to respond to that I had to create like a reset gesture so you could point down and click at any point in the thing and uh, create a way to like recenter the data reset the entire system take off all the filters and and it's you know it's it's a very there's a bunch there needs to be a bunch of conversation in this type of stuff because uh, these these systems. Um, yeah, they, I, I found that sometimes it's good to place some bumpers and limitations on sort of what, what, uh, people can do. But I, I, I bring that up because I think in, um, you know, when you are creating these immersive, interactive, augmented experiences for a client and a user or, or collaborators to be, to be talking about, or to, to sort of share ideas or information or conversation or insight, um, you know, you will run into some of those uh, complicated, <laughs> tricky issues. And, and you know, I, I, start, I started there because that was a good one because we had globes flying all over the place. And, and um, 
it was kind of funny. But back to the to this research with Rusty, like I even even at this point, even when he'd been in the system for a while, like there there were the the gestures were fairly straightforward. Actually, they were more complicated, and then we simplified them in order and limited them in order to create sort of an experience that he could drive as well. But if you look here, like I think I'm driving. Actually, I'm driving most of the system. He there's two wands in the one above, which is kind of fun. Actually, that's that's an interesting point for you too. So, like Rusty and I are both. You can see there's two little pink boxes floating around, and that's because we can both drive this system simultaneously. But even that introduces complexities because, like, what if, what it? Well, it could be neat. It could be like I could grab the system and he he could rotate it, and that's kind of fun. That would be neat, and and we did that. It was cool. But then. We could both try to grab the system or rotate it, and then how do you decide who has priority there? And typically, we assign like the first user, the first person to engage in an activity, got ownership. Um, but you know, it could also make things complicated because if two people wanted to do something different, um, you know, you could get conflicting actions. And I, you know, that that's one of the other reasons I actually really like these sort of architectural spaces as a way to explore the data is you had more sort of one-on-one -on -one interaction with the other person. Uh, I could look at him in the eye and and sort of see what he was thinking about or communicating with, about. And um, and there wasn't, you know, like I said, I, I love MR, I love VR, AR. Like I think there's a ton of potential there, but there are some advantages to, to all the different technologies. I think, oh, to get back to Elena's question, um, you know, I think where's the future future? like. We're, we're beyond just those iterations. I think the really cool thing that I want to see that I started to work on and then just didn't happen was uh, tying like these spatial operating environments, these architectural systems to AR and VR so that you could have a big architectural space with pixels everywhere and wear your HoloLens or whatever and go over and grab something out of that virtual screen space and pull it into the physical virtual space. And, and I think I think that's an interesting next step. The, the spatial operating environment that Oblong uses uh, allows you to do that kind of thing. I just never got far enough along to, to actually prototype it. But I, I think that could be a really cool space to work in, is how do you tie and connect all these different immersive augmented technologies to each other? That should have been the first answer I started with. Anyway, did I answer any of your question? <laughs> yes, you did. Thanks so much. OK, that's cool. Like inspirational. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, great question. You're thinking about all the right stuff. So, <laughs> um, John, I'll, I'll ask a question. Maybe the students yeah. will have another one in the meantime. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah. Um, and I definitely, and Barack is one of my students, but I have a couple of students who are really thinking of. Um, you, you talk here like uh, we were both in the system together in yeah. a way. You talk, right? And you know, a lot of our students are working in like downtown Los Angeles as their architectural site and thinking of ways to augment um, it, the, the environment in different ways. And I just wonder, after you've spent so much time in this kind of immersive system, I wonder what happens after a day, a week, or even years now, when you go, leave this environment, you go back into the city. Um, yeah. What do you see the, do you see the city differently or do you expect different things or does the city seem so slow to you now when or, or like as if it's hiding so much information um, um, and I just get curious to that how you see the city maybe differently after seeing yeah. all of these layers in the interior world that you've created yeah this is that's a great question this is really cool and I, I don't think I've been asked this before so I'm trying to think on the fly about it I mean so I think there's a couple different parts to this answer. Like one, I, I think, I think uh, I, I've always I think seen things a little differently. Like I'm always looking at relationships between objects in space. Like that dandelion piece that that we looked at. Uh, you know that 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 um oops that uh. How did we go through 80 slides in 40 minutes? I have no <laughs> idea, but we managed to do it. And I kind of figured I would. I practiced earlier, and it was like 45. And I'm like, OK, that's fine. We'll talk. But all this stuff is um, you know, the, the sort of spatial relationships in, in these systems is what's so fascinating to me. So this flower that has, you know, it's a relatively simple structure, right? It's got mm -hmm. these 
sort of links going out of it and it's got sort of this fluff associated with it. But the relationship, I, I've always been fascinated by this kind of thing. And I'll sit there and look at, uh, apparently even when I was younger, I did that dandelion. I still love dandelions and I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. But <laughs> I, I would, I'd love to just sit and look at something and watch it rotate and watch it move through space and, and think about how it changes through time. I mean, this goes back to the biology stuff, right? Like the developing organisms or embryo, embryogenesis. And, and I, you know, looking at things in relation to each other, how they move through time, how trees blow in the wind, how, you know, all, all those things. So I, I'm always looking at that kind of stuff. And I think that informs my work, especially with nat natural systems a lot. Um, but then, you know, from the technology aspect, yeah, like I, I think John's talk is probably the most interesting uh, reference there. But just this idea that, um, I don't know, or even Team Labs, some, some of their stuff, right? That just have pixels everywhere and have these mm -hmm. incredibly immersive experiences that are constantly churning around you. Um, you know, I, th I think... I, I think I do, I do look around and see opportunities for that. And, uh, oh, I skipped over John's stuff. I did, yeah, I, I mean, I think there are some really, all right, so there's two more parts to that answer. So one, yeah, I look around, I see opportunities all the time. Like, I think there's some really neat places where, I mean, signage is a really obvious one, right? Like immersive signage that could respond or move with people. Or there's that scene in Minority Report where it's terrible. Like, it's not the future I want, but Tom Cruise is walking through and there's ads all in his face all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's that's not, that one's not that appealing to me. And, and there's been other pieces that are done sort of like that. But there are a bunch of interesting opportunities for sort of helpful augmentation like that. And then I think maybe the third part of the answer is, um, like, are there... Are there image artifacts or like, you know, if you're sitting inside of, uh, you know how if, you, if you're out surfing or in a boat or something like that and you get off the water and you're moving still a bit mm -hmm. and you know, that mm -hmm. over thing. And I, there's, there's, I think there's a bit of that as well. And sometimes, you know, I did, I, I typically don't have much in the way of motion sickness or, um, you know, I've never really had trouble with stuff, but we did get to, like some points like this system could make people pretty sick pretty quickly and <laughs> I did discover, you know, I do have some limitations on the amount of information that I can have going around me. And for exactly that reason. So you would, you'd sit in here and it, it would become disorienting quickly because you, you sort of get this real sense of vertical or vertigo or movement as, as you know, you could see where Justin was sitting. So we would sit kind of like right in the center of the system Mm -hmm. you stop paying attention to it and stuff's going by on the sides and background you start to get kind of a bit of vertigo and so when we we're working with some of these more intense systems and coming out of it um yeah that 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 kind of stuff did did happen as well but i um i, I actually think that's one of the reasons i kind of like the the architectural installations as, if, as as a method for immersion because um yeah if you're not if you're not trying to test the limits of your system and yourself by creating some crazy installation, um, you know, I, I tended to have a pretty easy time with, you know, motion in these systems, even if it was something like mm -hmm. food. Or something. Um, Great. Uh, that, that's very indicative of the way I think as well. It goes all over the place and, and explores like three or four different possibilities mm -hmm. of other things and, did, did we hit any or yeah? Yeah, no, for sure. I just always find it fascinating people that put themselves in extreme situations in their research, especially spatially. Then I feel yeah. like you're the type of person that then comes back and has a lot more expectations of what architecture can do and what the city can do. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think even these, okay. So we figured out a way to talk about some of these. So like, this is just the kind of stuff that you know, I'll see a flocking algorithm and be like, hey, can I wrap that around a sphere so that everything lines up? And, and, and then maybe let's assign color to them based on their direction or orientation. And, and a lot of the stuff are just these kind of experiments where, um, you know, hey, can I apply, apply different forces interacting with each other or different, uh, um, I don't, yeah, like you said, this is very intuitive. I'm like, I want a sphere and I want little spikes coming off of it. And I want little balls at the end. And then I want trails at the end because I can. And this <laughs> happens. 
and uh, and then let's apply a noise noise you know noise force to it and see what kind of shapes it makes and does it make kind of like a sea dragon or uh, oh, what are those little guys called? Um, anyway, does it make some some undersea organism that that you know is evocative of that or is it evocative of an embryo or something like that? And I mean a lot of a lot of uh, yeah. A lot of my a lot of my sort of personal studies and work are these little explorations where you're trying to see like hey, can I can I take data so this is from like an iPhone 12 right I just use the face scanner in it and, uh, and start distorting it with noise and putting and and running shaders over it and uh, and and it's fun I, I've kind of always worked this way very intuitively I, it's interesting being at HRL because it's a very sort of research. Uh, focused scientific institution, but um, I, I'm incredibly lucky because the researchers have have given me quite a bit of leeway to be intuitive, and 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 often I'll be working on something like this and then come back and say, oh, that's actually an interesting way to deal with a scientific problem or this this visualization problem that we have, um, and and figure out some interesting way to sort of think about, you know, how does something move through time or how do you look at potential of something and. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I yeah, I found Instagram's been a nice way to sort of as an interesting public place to 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 put some of those things and to be able to have conversations with other artists and designers about them. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. All this stuff is spatial too, right? They're all three D scans that I'm messing around with. Yeah, you, uh, you do a fantastic job at um, visualizing things that are very ephemeral and difficult to understand. And I think nowadays data has been, uh, I mean, we need to look at data. I think we, we cannot even be an architect or designers without looking at data. It's not that we design with this anthropocentric view, but we need to look at a lot of um, numbers and things that might not have an easy visualization. I think your work, it's very important for architects because it allows us to see things that are nice patterns or visualizations that are not that easy to find. Um, and I think making something comprehensible of something that usually is not that comprehensible, it's uh, a very important design task for uh, any uh, anybody today that needs to deal with systems that are this complex. So thank you for being here and thank you the students for um, being participating in this lecture. Uh, next week, um, we'll have a new guest. Uh, John, thank you for your fantastic um, contribution yeah. to our formal lecture series. Well, thank you so then thank, yeah, and thank you so much for bringing that point up at the end, because that, that's actually one of the points that I meant to make. What are those, what are those filters that, and what are those, those methods that allow you to sort of see those patterns? And, and that, yeah, that, again, that's a, another one of my focuses. So. I meant to say that, but thank you. This is why our conversations are always great, is you always figure out kind of what I'm trying to say with the 80s <laughs> and then sit down into a couple. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you. And thank you, John. If we're doing research or anything like that, uh, that's related to any of this, I'm happy to talk to people over email or anything. Fantastic. They might.